Ten years ago, INSEAD and the World Economic Forum embarked upon a project to gauge and categorize the tech readiness of countries of the world. Well, today, that Global Information Technology Report has become the benchmark for gauging a country's technological sophistication, uh, its quality of life, its economic well-being, and its attitudes towards its citizens. Well, joining me now on INSEAD Knowledge to mark the GITR's 10th anniversary is INSEAD Professor Sumitra Dutta, who's also one of the founders and co-authors of the report. Welcome again to INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you, Shelley. We should start by doing a little bit of an overview, perhaps, of the rankings and what, what came out this year. Um, but what always amazes me is the Nordic countries always do very well. Sweden is number one. The, the Nordic countries are four in the top 10, five of the top 20. What is it about the Nordic countries? Well, one could just joke and say it's the weather, but I think there's <laughs> more than the weather out there that's playing the magic. The Nordic countries have historically invested very heavily in human capital. Uh, so if you look at the levels of education, the degree of innovation supported in the classroom, it really stands out. So people and the human talent that is in Nordic countries is really amazing. And that, I think, is at the heart of the success of Nordic countries. And of course, accompanying that is a very technology-savvy culture, a culture that supports uh, the use of technology. And certainly, as you know, in countries like Finland, there's a very, very active technology culture and technology entrepreneurship. And also in countries like Sweden, they have invested very heavily in providing the right kind of environment from the government side in promoting technology. So it's a combination of all these elements that brings them together. It's interesting too because in, for example, in cases in Finland with Nokia, I mean that morph, that company itself morphed from a wood company into technology. So I mean they've really changed their whole business model to focus on technology. Yeah, in fact, Nokia's transformation very much mirrors the country's transformation. If you go back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the economy of Finland was largely based on natural resources. And then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, what happened was the economy of Finland started shrinking dramatically. And then the country decided strategically, and this is very important, there was a national strategic decision made involving the government, the key universities, the key private sector leaders, to transform the economy of Finland into a knowledge-based economy. And that really was fundamental. Clearly, Nokia was a leader driving the process, but there was a set of strategic decisions made. And in fact, the Council for Science and Technology in Finland is chaired with the Prime Minister himself. Well, that, that kind of strategic decision on the part of government is one of the criteria that you look at, is it, is it not? If you look at the results that we have seen over the last several years in terms of which countries have done well and have succeeded in using technology effectively, certainly government leadership stands out. And uh, countries in the Nordic region, they stand out in this area, but also, to be very open and honest, countries in Asia and especially Middle East have also done a lot in terms of technology uh, improvements. In Asia, if you look at Singapore, Singapore number two. comes in number two. I think the level of leadership shown by the Singapore government in terms of technology is absolutely remarkable. And quite surprisingly for many people, the Middle East in general also shows a very high degree of improvements in terms of technology awareness and implementation in the last four or five years. In fact, our study shows that if you take regions across the world over the last five years, the Middle East has shown the highest relative improvement in technology usage worldwide. And in many of these countries, the government has been a very key driver behind the technology push. In the Middle East, you, have, you, you also have this push to technology, but you have a certain degree of control and you have all the revolutions that we've been seeing. Can you draw some kind of an analogy between all of that? I mean, yeah, and one can, you know, I've heard some people say, well, you know, look, in some sense, uh, technology is unleashing a whole series of changes which was unplanned for and unforeseen for by many of these governments in the, in, the, in the region. But if you look at it in some sense, a lot of economies in the Middle East, they know that they have to transform the economies. So that's something that they all know. And they all know that the future economies will be driven by knowledge and by human capital. So it was based on these kinds of strategic logic that many economies in the region invested very heavily in increasing access to technology, spreading the internet across societies, and reforming the telecom sector in many cases to allow more competition and bring down prices. 
So that has been tremendously important. Also, many of these governments have improved the access to government services by implementing e-government, a variety of e-government services through a fairly strong government push. And this kind of increased access to technology today, of course, has empowered a whole generation of young Arab citizens in the Middle East. And today, in some results, in some ways, what we are seeing happening and what has happened in some countries in the Middle East can directly be attributed to some of these changes that have been brought about by technology societies. So one cannot always foresee all the changes technology will bring, and that is true even for us going looking forward. So in Middle East, we have seen both good and maybe at some stages sometimes not so great consequence to people who drove it. Well, it's disruptive a little bit, but that's not necessarily bad. Change can absolutely change is I disruptive whether it's good or bad. So it, it really depends on what happens next. So in fact, it forces governments and forces institutions to be much more transparent, to recognize the power of people, and to respect the power of people much more. What are some of the changes that you've seen that technology has brought? I mean, we 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 see it reduces poverty. We've seen it increases political activity? There, there have been a number of very important changes that we have seen in the world around us in the last, I would say, decade. I remember very clearly when we started discussing this whole report uh, about nine, ten years ago, there were very few sources of credible data about impact of technology. There were a few anecdotes here and there, but not really in systematic data collection. So one great contribution that the report has made of the last ten years it is that it has much more formalized and strengthened the basis for taking policy decisions about technology on the basis of hard data, not just you know anecdotes and not just what you think about things, but really based on hard data. And today, using the results of the Global IT report of the last 10 years, we can actually show that countries that have made some key decisions have succeeded in increasing access and improving competitiveness, and fundamentally, we can identify levers that are important for moving the right direction. Now, we also have seen that technology has a very fundamental impact on development. This wasn't clear 10 years ago. Today, we take it as a granted, and we have seen studies showing how increase in mobile telephony in countries has increased the GDP of the economy and so on. But today, we have data to support these things, and before, we did not have that. So the impact of technology on transformation and productivity improvements is very well documented. And today we are also starting to see the impact of technology on countries which are more poor and maybe the citizen population less educated. So you take a country like India, uh, the penetration of mobile phones in India is today very high. It's about 60, 70 percent of the population. And a whole generation, a whole large section of Poor people today in India are much more empowered because of access to information. And this is changing the culture in the way people interact and the way governments operate in many of these economies. Well, we certainly saw that as well in places like Tunisia, um, most of North Africa, I mean Egypt. Um, how have those countries been changing over the last couple of years? What you see is technology moves at a pace which is quite dramatic, and certainly in some of these countries, technology has been pushed by the government in many cases, as I said earlier. But then the institutions themselves haven't changed accordingly. So there's a mismatch that has happened between the powers unleashed by technology access and technology awareness in populations and the rigidity that you have seen, the lack of transparency and lack of participation that you have seen in many of the governments and institutions that are behind uh, the societies. So if you have an increasing gap between what people are empowered to do or the field they like to do and between what the system supports that, you will have a friction. And clearly what we have seen in the Middle East in the last, uh, let's say, a few weeks or months have been the result of growing friction between uh, the systems and the, and the citizen bodies in these uh, economies. So there is a pressure that builds in to bring more alignment between the institutions and the people's expectations. I just want to look at Japan for a minute because it was it surprised me that it was number 19. I think we think of Japan as being the technology capital of the world. Uh, maybe that's outdated. Um, but I'm just wondering, first of all, um, is that kind of a lowish rating? Is that surprising? And two, what impact are the natural disasters that we've seen likely to have on on their technology sector, on their on their growth as technology goes? 
Well, 19 is not bad, so let's, no? let's okay. put it in context. <laughs> no, it's not number one, but the difference between the top 10, 20 is not huge. So clearly numerically it comes out to be uh, you know, one versus 20, but actual difference between the level of achievements is not that high, not that different. So 19 is a very good rating. Now clearly it could be higher and could be stronger. And if you look at the areas where Japan probably misses out or loses a few points, are areas linked largely to the environment that exists in these economies. In Japan, for example, the political macroeconomic environment is much more bureaucratic, much more sluggish, and much more rigid as compared to many of the economies. Uh, Japan also has an issue in terms of human mobility, in terms of talent. Japan does not necessarily support a high degree of talent uh, migration to the country like the way U.S. does. You know, U.S., one of the reasons why U.S. does very well is because the U.S. is extremely successful in attracting foreign talent. So Japan has great human talent internally, but it does not do a very good job in attracting additional talent from outside. So a number of factors linked to some bureaucratic policies, uh, some rigid in the environment fundamentally pull Japan down. So as a result of this, what you find, for example, in Japan is it's much harder for people to start businesses. You know, the, the economic system is much more rigid. So as compared to some other economies like Israel or in the U.S. So if you're unable to start businesses technology, then fundamentally your ability to use technology and leverage it decreases. You mentioned the U.S. I noticed that was number five. Has it been fairly steady? Um, are there changes? Anything different this year? Well, the U.S. is steady as compared to last year, but it fell a couple of spots, I think, about a year or two ago. Again, as I said, falling from three to five is not that dramatic. So number five for a large economy like the U.S. is extremely respectable, is very respectable. But what is important for the U.S. to realize is that its position of dominance is not guaranteed. And second, much more important, is to understand the key factors that are pulling it down. So some of the factors pulling the U.S. down, once again, relate to the rigid environmental factors that exist in the country. Look, take, for example, the legal system. The legal system in the country is quite a barrier for businesses in many ways. Uh, the level of bureaucracy that you see even in the U.S. in many of the processes is extremely high. Uh, if you take, for example, uh, issues like uh, you know, protection for investors, again, many of the legal processes around that can be improved further. So even the U.S. can improve on some of the legal and some of the bureaucracy that is in the system, but also the investment the U.S. makes in human capital can be improved. So the level of schools in America is a little uneven. Universities, of course, are some world-class, some of the best in the, in, 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 the, in the world, but at the same time, the overall average level can be improved. You look at, for example, students in high schools in some Nordic countries, they usually perform much better in terms of their own educational systems. And also the infrastructure in terms of roads and airports in the U.S. today is no longer the best. There has been underinvestment in that area. Did you do much research in social media? Has that come up? And aside from sort of the traditional wood-burning technology like the internet. Um, what about Facebook and Twitter and things like that? Does that factor into this at all? One of the challenges in, in assessing technology for countries, especially large number of countries, is technology keeps evolving. So you have to keep introducing questions and introducing uh, aspects that reflect today's technology. For example, today social media is saying it's very important. A similar way uh, fixed line penetration is not that important. You know, five, ten years ago it was very important. Today, fixed line penetration is not a very important measure for, for te technology uh, sophistication. So, recognizing this kind of a change in technology, we have introduced a couple of questions of social media usage, especially focused on impact of social media on organizations, impact of social media on societies. Let me end by asking you how you got started with this, uh, how INSEAD and the, and the World Economic Forum got together 10 years ago and you decided to do this, and has the evolution surprised you? You know, when we got started, as I said, the driver was very much to better understand some of the issues around the digital divide and to better understand what kind of policies can you put in place to support development and effective competitiveness policies in the, in, in the world. And today, we are very proud and happy that the 
framework behind the global IT report. Some of the results have been very influential in influencing government policy making in a number of regions of the world. I know of countries where the entire national technology policy is influenced very strongly by our framework and the results. Now the challenge for us is of course to make sure that what we are proposing serves as an effective guide for the future because technology is becoming much more pervasive in society and as technology becomes much more pervasive, measuring the impact of technology in society is becoming much more harder. Take social media for example. How do you truly measure the impact of social media on individual creativity? It's you know, clearly a number of applications on Facebook, but you know, truly actually understanding does technology help people become more creative? Now these are very important aspects, but measuring them in a uniform, consistent manner is very difficult. So these are challenges that will keep us busy over the next few years, but what we certainly hope is the Global Technology Report will continue to provide a guidance to policymakers in both the private and public sectors, and also much more importantly, serve to inspire people who want to be innovative, who want to be creative with technology. Thank you very much, Sumitra Dutta, for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you very much.